مساء الخير جميعا ورحب بكم جميعا اساتذتي الافاضل الحضور الكرام نلتقي بكم في لقاء جديد ضمن سلسله على اكتاف العمالقه on the shoulders of giants التي نستضيف فيها كبار الاسماء في مجال الفيزياء عموما والفيزياء النظريه خصوصا نتمنى لقاء اليوم ان يكون مثمرا غنيا مفيدا مفعما بالمعلومات التي سنتلقاها من العالم الكبير ناثان سايبر كان اللقاء والتحضير للقاء مع البروفيسور ناثان سايبر صعبا استنزف قدرا كبيرا من الجهد وخاصه في تحضير المعلومات التي اود ان اقدمها كمقدم في البدايه عنه لان معظم لقاءاته كانت تخصصيه محاضرات مغرقه في العمق فتقديم شيء للعموم عن البروفيسور ناثان سايبر كان امرا صعبا في الحقيقه بكل الاحوال يركز بحث ناثان ناثان سايبر على جوانب مختلفه من نظريه الاوتار ونظريه المجال الكمومي او الحقل الكمومي وفيزياء الجسيمات ساهم في اعماله في فهم ديناميكيات نظريات المجال الكمومي وخاصه نظريات المجال لكم الفائق التناظر السوبر سترينج كشفت حلوله الدقيقه لمثل هذه النظريات عن العديد من الرؤى الجديده وغير المتوقعه بما في ذلك الدور الاساسي للازدواجيه الواليتي المغناطيسيه الكهربائيه في هذه النظريات وهو ما ادى من خلال الحلول التي قدمها والحلول الدقيقه ايضا التي قدمها الى العديد من التطبيقات الحقيقه في الفيزياء والرياضيات لقد اوضح ايضا كيف يمكن كسر التناظر الفائق ديناميكيا واستكشف العواقب الظاهراتيه الفينومينولوجيكال لكسر التناظر الفائق وهي من الامور التي سيتم اختبارها في مصادم الهدرونات الاكبر او الكبير ال LHC. سيكون معنا الدكتور اكرم مشكورا في مقابله في لقاء في حوار مع البروفيسور نيفن سيبدا بمجموعه من الاسئله في نهايه لقائنا ان شاء الله مع البروفيسور نيفن سنتلقى اسئلتكم سنحاول خلال المحاضره دكتور اكرم تلخيص النقاط الاساسيه في الحوار يمكن ان تترافق الترجمه العربيه لبعض النقاط او اهم الافكار المطروحه على الشات في الزوم بعد الانتهاء من اللقاء ان شاء الله سنتلقى اسئلتكم نفضل ان تكون الاسئله مقرونه بالمشاهده فتح الكاميرا والصوت ان لم يكن ممكنا فممكن ان نكتفي بالصوت ايضا لم يكن ممكنا فممكن ان نكون بالشكل الفيديو نترك الميكروفون للدكتور اكرم للقاء البروفيسور ناثان سايف دكتور اكرم So thank you so much I mean for uh, Ahmed for this Again I mean for this I mean for accepting my invitation uh, it is a really a great honor for me I mean to have you with uh, Arabic audience I mean um, I send as I said uh, many invitations to also big names in theoretical physics in the Arabic world I mean we have a lot I mean with us uh, uh, here, for example, um, uh, Professor Shaban Khalil, I mean, uh, he is the head of uh, theoretical physics at Zwil City uh, in Cairo. We have also with us uh, Professor, uh, the great name, I mean, theoretical physics, which I respect him, the, um, Professor Basil Tai, he's Iraqi, he's now in um, uh, in Leeds University at UK, and also um, I mean, one of the big names is uh, Saidi, uh, is uh, f from Morocco, uh, yeah, Rabat University. So thank you so much. And um, maybe uh, we can start. I mean, as I said, Professor, in the beginning, um, we have mixed audience between specialists and also uh, public. So we will start by a few public, uh, I mean, a few uh, fundamental deep questions. Then we move to the, I mean, uh, maybe string theory and dualities and uh, your contributions. So uh, the first questions come into my mind. So maybe you can, uh, this is, as I said, for the public uh, audience in the beginning. So maybe you can discuss about um, or summarize uh, the revolutions of uh, GR and quantum mechanics uh, in the past decades. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Okay, yes, yes. So, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure and honor to talk to this audience. You asked me about the revolution, so 
let me just say that I think physics in the 20th century has completely changed. And it changed because of several revolutions that took place at uh, the beginning of the 20th century. First, there was the quantum revolution with quantum theory. And at more or less the same time, there was Einstein's special theory of relativity and eventually Einstein's general theory of relativity. And these revolutions completely changed our perception of what the universe looks like. Uh, the quantum revolution basically told us that various things that we thought were completely deterministic. Every experiment, you do the, perform the experiment twice, you get exactly the same answer. And quantum, the quantum revolution taught us that this is not so. There is some natural probability built into our understanding. And we cannot do better than that. Einstein's special theory of relativity addresses questions of bodies that move at very high velocity, close to the speed of light. And general relativity incorporates special, Einstein's special theory of relativity in, with the gravitational force. And it tells us that even space and time itself, if we consider as we see around us, can be curved. And the gravitational force is a consequence of this curvature of space and even time. So all these revolutions were very abstract, very different than our normal day-to-day -day intuition, but they are facts. They're true and they're not disputed. Nobody these days thinking that they are not true. During the second half of the 20th century, the theory of special relativity and the theory of quantum theory, these two theories were unified into a framework known as quantum theory. And that framework allowed us to describe a lot of phenomena, both about the microscopic world of elementary particles, but also about properties of materials in the field of condensed matter physics. Again, there is no question that this development is correct. He agrees with a lot of experiments with enormous unprecedented accuracy. There are several challenges that are still ahead of us. And in this direction, there has been a lot of progress over the last several decades. One of them is to understand this quantum field theory better, to understand its consequences, and also to pursue our understanding to shorter and shorter distances the shortest distances that are being explored today are explored at the Hadron Collider at the laboratory called CERN outside Geneva. But the energy can get much higher and correspondingly distances that will be observed will be much shorter. And at the moment, we do not know what happens at shorter distances. People can speculate about all sorts of ideas and maybe we'll talk about them later. But this is more or less the edge of our knowledge in this direction. So we more or less understand what's going on up to distances around 30 to minus 16, 17 meters. If we try to go uh, further than that uh, to shorter distances, then we do not know. Uh, oops, I have to raise my voice a little bit. Okay, is it better now? Can you I hear me? I think if you can, maybe you can uh, raise your voice a little okay, bit. Okay, I'll get to sit closer to the microphone. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean. Okay, so at shorter distances, we do not know what happens. And this is one big challenge. Uh, the other big challenge is to merge these other revolutions. We talked about two revolutions, two notions of special relativity and quantum mechanics, which were merged in quantum field theory, the other evolution, general relativity, which describes the gravitational force, that has not yet been merged properly with the others. This is where string theory comes in. It's our best attempt to merge them, but we are still far from a complete picture. And maybe we'll also talk about that later. Okay, thank you so much. So we move now because, uh, I mean, we discuss about these two revolutionary theories. It's look like the universe has two minds. I mean, 
before worked separately, I mean, before string theory. Now, um, I mean, after that, uh, the work of Veneziano with the, I mean, uh, the dual uh, theory and all of proposal or uh, theorem. So he um, um, used this idea of strings and after that, uh, the work of Schwartz and other, and uh, they found that um, this, uh, uh, I mean, one extended uh, dimensional object, which is the strings, I mean, uh, might have or contains the, the, the all four fundamental forces. But the most important questions, which uh, I mean comes to my mind and uh, other people, why the necessity for the unification? Maybe, uh, for example, the other quantum uh, uh, theories addressing, um, I mean, uh, the, the, the problem of the quantization of uh, gravitational interactions. I mean, they just interest about quantizing GR. So why we are looking for a unification? So uh, last point, I mean, when they ask, for example, uh, Steven Weinberg about his uh, point of view about the unifications, he believed with the point of view of Dirac that, I mean, uh, uh, the theory of everything, it's the most beautiful, I mean, theory that we can, uh, we have or will have in the future. And if we go uh, starting by Newton, up to now, we see that, uh, I, mean, um, uh, the, I mean, there is a, a lot of unifications, like, for example, Newton's, Maxwell, between uh, magnetism and electricity. Uh, after that, for example, when we go to uh, Glasher, Weinberg, and Salam, and the unification. So there is a lot of unifications, and these unifications led to simplicity. But simplicity, we need to reach at some end point for simplicity. Uh, I mean, uh, so maybe this uh, final answer, the simple answer, uh, uh, or uh, the simplest possible answer for a description of the nature will be the, uni uh, the unified theory of everything. So uh, professor, why we need, uh, I mean, uh, the, or why we need this kinds of unification. I personally view unification not as a goal, but as something to guide our thoughts. I think we should distinguish between correct theories and wrong theories. And it's not up to us to decide whether unification is good or bad. This is something that nature knows. So we are trying to understand the correct answer. And there is a correct answer. And for some questions, we know what the answer is. For other questions, we do not yet know what the answer is. And we should try and push our envelope and our knowledge so that we can address more and more questions and get more and more agreements between theory and experiment. This is our goal. Now, sometimes it's very difficult. And therefore, we're looking for principles to guide us in the search for the correct answer. And the simplicity of the theory, or the beauty of the theory, or unification, or the number of parameters that are being used, things like that are, I view them as guide, that guide us in the right direction. This is not the goal. The goal is not to find unification. The goal is to find the correct theory of nature. It, it's much better if what we find is a nice, beautiful theory which unifies many different things. Now, historically, it works such that the nice theories were also the correct one. But that was not always the case. There are many historical examples where people went after the beauty of the theory and they constructed absolutely gorgeous theories which were completely wrong. So I. So some people have better taste and they know how, how to align what they think is beautiful turns out to be correct. But most people should just be guided by experiment and we would like theory to agree with experiment. And beauty is first in the eyes of the beholder, but also this is just something that to guide us, it's not the goal itself. This is my view, other people might have other views. Having said that, on very general grounds, 
we have a theory with some number of parameters which we go and measure and then using these parameters we can predict a lot of other numbers. The fewer parameters our theory has, the more predictive it is. And what unification does is reduce the number of free parameters. But I, again, this is a secondary goal. We should really get something that agrees with experiment and then take it from there. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor, for this, uh, I mean, answer now. Uh, I mean, when we discuss, I mean, if you um, see the, the biggest revolution, I mean, even starting by Isaac Newton or going through, um, I mean, the history to uh, Albert Einstein and the, this magnificent theories, I mean, uh, you will find that um, there is uh, uh, a work, I mean, about the fundamental notion of space and time. So those big guys, I mean, change the notion of space and time. So um, if we really think about uh, string theory or other, I mean, um, uh, theories which merge uh, Einstein general theory of gravity and quantum mechanics uh, to one framework. So what, uh, uh, I mean, um, the impact on uh, uh, I mean, uh, about, I mean, the notion of space-time. So, again, we should go through the things we, I would say that roughly it's the, up to the 19th century, through the 20th century, in the future. So up to 19th century, space and time were very similar to what we feel around us. Space was space, and separately with time. Time is not fully understood intuitively beyond the intuitive picture. Philosophers have been talking a lot about what does it mean to have time. Time moves only forward, never goes backwards. And we have a notion of causality. Things in the past influence things in the future, but things in the future do not influence things in the past. This is 19th century, up to the end of the 19th century. Around that time, the picture changed. In the physics side, it's mostly due to Einstein's work. Space and time got mixed together. Time was not absolute, but and space and time could be curved. It's not the obvious notion of space and time that we see around us. But this curved space time, even if it changes, it's kind of an arena in which things happen. So in class, until the 19th century, the arena was stable. Due to Einstein's theory, the arena itself can change. So when we put a body in, it curved space. And as it curved space, it influences the motion of other bodies. Moving to the 21st century, by now, the prevailing view among string theorists is that the notion of space, and therefore perhaps also the notion of time, should be emergent notion. So the fundamental theory will not have any notion of space, will not have any notion of time, there will be something else. And the idea of space, and the idea of time, and the intuitive understanding that goes with it, will be some kind of an approximation to a deeper truth in the underlying theory. I can give an example of that that is not accurate, but will give you some feel of it. Imagine you look at the ocean or a lake, and you see the shape of the water, the surface of the water. And there could be waves, and if there's wind, there could be waves moving on the surface. And you can just view the surface as kind of a curved sheet, like a two-dimensional plane, which is where the surface is, and it changes as a function of space and as a function of time as the waves move. If, however, you look at it very closely with a powerful microscope, you see that there's really no surface there. The fact that there is a surface is an approximation. The fact that there is a surface there is more like an illusion. Instead, we have lots of molecules of water bouncing around below a certain line, and we have molecules of air bouncing around above that, and there isn't really a clear separation between the water and the air. So the analogy is that if we look from afar, and we see a surface, 
this is the way we perceive space and time today. The more microscopic description, which is more correct, which involves the molecules of water and the molecules of air, this deeper, this deeper picture is more correct. And that's the analog of string theory or whatever would come there at shorter distances to replace. Now, this is not to say that the description in terms of the surface of the water is, is wrong. It's not wrong. It's very good. It's a very good approximation. And it's very useful. In fact, we have some equations that describe the shape of the water. These are Navier-Stokes equations. So we know the equations that describe the shape of the water. They come, the whole field of hydrodynamics is devoted to understanding the shape of the water. But more, more microscopically, hydrodynamics is an approximation of something else. And indeed, the true theory is the tree of theory of the molecules. But in practice, the theory of the molecules is very interesting and very useful to study the molecules. But if you want to know how the waves move on the ocean, it's the underlying molecules will be totally useless because the problem will be so complicated you will not know what to do with it. Instead, we have these equations, these Navier-Stokes equations of hydrodynamics, and they tell us how the shape of the water evolves. So in this analogy, Einstein's theory of relativity is the analog of hydrodynamics, of the equations that describe the shape of the water. And the structure of molecules underneath, which, give, uh, which the structure that gives us the more complete description in which there is no surface, this is the microscopic theory that eventually we will find. Hopefully, it will be related to ideas that are being discussed today in string theory. Okay, Professor. So um, when we discuss, because you, I know that you have a code uh, about the emergence of space and time. I mean, we all, uh, as theoretical physicists, we know for sure space is emergent. I mean, uh, why? Because for example, if you take, uh, for example, in quantum mechanics, the wave function and you write in terms of space X and you change, uh, um, um, I mean, your space to the momentum space P, you can uh, reformulate all the quantum mechanics without needing to, to the space. So, but time, I mean, even right now, there is, uh, I mean, a separation between physicists, some of them like, for example, Lee Smolin and uh, other big names, uh, I mean, uh, uh, still thinking that time is uh, fundamental. But the other big names, I mean, string theory community and also in LQG, like Carlo Rovilli and the others, I mean, change their mind. I mean, um, as time also is an emergence. So space time is an approximation, as you said. So when uh, really uh, this kind of debate or this kind of separation between physicists really started because at the time of Newton or after uh, even in Einstein, I mean, they still, I mean, uh, um, think that time is fundamental, but uh, most of physicists, they think that the corner uh, um, uh, or the subtle point of changing our um, point of view about um, uh, is time fundamental or um, emergent is about Wheeler-DeWitt equation. So when we try to write as in Wheeler mind, the Einstein-Schrodinger equations or the wave function for gravitational interactions, which, which is Wheeler-DeWitt equations, time suddenly disappears. So the dynamics, we don't need time. So do you think that this is really the start point, I mean, at short distances and high energies, or there is something deep that uh, make uh, theoretical physicists change their minds about the emergence of time? Okay, so first of all, the older view in the notion of the will of the wheel equation, it's true that there is no explicit time in the will of the wheel equation. But there is a way to define time, even in, in general relativity, even in weakly coupled general relativity or, weak, or gravitational theory with with quantum mechanics. This, there is a clear notion of time and it's not in contradiction with the will of the way equation. And basically, if you 
formulate the theory of on the space with the boundary, you measure the, the time at infinity. And that's unambiguous. So there is a way to define time, even with the will of the will equation. Having said that, <clears throat> the prevailing view, and I don't think there's a lot of debate about that, is that if space is emerging, then time should also be emerging. Because according to Einstein's, even special relativity, space and time mix together. So if we have a theory without space, it's very unlikely that we have that it has time. Now, this poses a huge challenge, and I can just start enumerating questions. I don't even know. I can enumerate lots of questions which will make which will show that if time is emerging we will really have to think about everything differently. For example, time is different than space in the sense of causality. One event is before the other. The past can influence the future. How can we discuss causality if we don't have a preconceived notion of time? Another way of saying it is that physics is about describing time evolution. I make a prediction before I perform the experiment, and then I perform the experiment to test my prediction. If there is no underlying notion of time, what does it mean to make a prediction about the outcome of the experiment? In what sense is the experiment up to the prediction? I don't have any wisdom to offer on this question, except to say that if space is emergent, it's hard to imagine that time is not emergent. And there's a lot of evidence that space is emerging. Again, not space at infinity, but space in the interior of the system. This is, not, again, not to be confused with the freedom to perform reparameterization either of space or of time, which is what underlies the will of the will equation. The will of the will equation is a statement about the ability to perform reparameterization of time or space. But we, can, we still have some time and space that we can reparameterize. The idea of these notions being emergent, of not being present in the fundamental theory, is the statement that we do not even have anything to reparameterize. The whole idea of coordinate invariance, which underlies Einstein's field of relativity, would be some kind of an approximation that emerges when it's not present in the original theory. Now, for space, we have some examples how to do it. And for time, there is no example how to do it. So this is a huge challenge. Now, this challenge will be very interesting, I think, for two ways to conquering this or understanding how time emerges will have two very, very deep consequences. Number one, quantum mechanics is about unitary evolution, how things evolve as a function of if time is an emerging concept, maybe quantum mechanics itself will be an emerging concept also. So that's one aspect of it, which will be very interesting. The second aspect of it is that when space is emerging, what it means is that we look at very, very short distances, space doesn't exist. The notion of space doesn't mean anything. This is similar to examining the shape of the water with very, very good resolution to very short distances, we don't see the shape of the water. Instead, what we see is the molecules and there is no real space. The analogous thing in time is that if time is emerging at very, very short times, the notion of time will not make sense. Where is very short time most interesting? Where is it most important? This is at the beginning of the universe, at the Big Bang, when the universe was a point, and the universe, the universe was very, very early, tiny fraction of a second. At that point in time, before that time, the notion of time didn't make any sense. So it won't make any sense to ask what happens before the Big Bang, because the word before assumes that there is an underlying notion of time. One thing happened before something else. But if time doesn't exist there, we cannot ask questions like, what happened before the Big Bang? So understanding how this happens 
will undoubtedly shed a lot of light on creation itself, on the Big Bang, on how the universe appeared. And that's clearly a very, very exciting, very deep and interesting question. Unfortunately, I have nothing useful to say about it. <laughs> okay, Professor. So uh, one other thing about time, and maybe we close, uh, I mean, the gate of time, because it's more maybe, uh, I mean, deep and uh, philosophical, but I discussed just about the, the, the question uh, the quest of uh, the unification. Now, if you, as you discuss, if um, uh, in general re relativity, I mean, all our equations, I mean, trace back on a point, which is, I mean, um, uh, the Big Bang, which is the starting or the beginning of the universe. So, and um, so even uh, uh, at the level of arrow of time, it's look like, I mean, in general relativity, that, that there is a specific arrow of time based also on uh, something called the past hypothesis. But in quantum mechanics, I mean, there is no such kind of arrow. I mean, um, uh, uh, Schrodinger equations, I mean, the T there, you, you can't go from minus T to plus T. I mean, from minus infinity to plus, uh, plus infinity. So how can you merge between two theories which has a deep difference about the concept of arrow of time. One has a beginning, the second one, I mean, that does not, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, make a difference between uh, uh, plus T or minus. Yeah, so you really, this is a, a fantastic question. And that's really one of many reasons why it is so challenging. It's so challenging because when we discuss quantum mechanics or even quantum field theory, we assume that there is a pre-existing notion of space and a pre-existing notion of time. And then we write the theory and then we calculate things. We can predict time, we perform time evolution. We know what the system does now and we can predict what the system will do in the future. If you throw a ball in the air, you know what, what velocity you give it and then you can predict the trajectory of the ball. But if time doesn't exist, I don't even know how to start thinking about it. What is it that we should compute? So as I said, I have nothing to offer except more and more questions on this issue. Uh, Professor, just to, to make a point clear, because maybe there is some audience, I mean, confused. When we say that time does not exist, uh, we mean time is not fundamental. Yes, exactly. That's what we mean. This, there should be something else. And the notion of time as we understand it will be some kind of an approximation of something else. Now, I do not know what it is. This is all a pie in the sky. This is kind of more of a research direction. And maybe some of the younger people in the audience would be motivated by that and they would figure it out. This is a huge question. And personally, I think that understanding this question will in one swoop answer a lot of very, very deep questions in physics. This would be a huge revolution on the scale of Einstein's revolution. So but this is a huge question. Yeah. We don't know the answer to that. So this questions, this answering, uh, for example, might maybe uh, in the future, there is a physicist or maybe group of uh, theoretical physicists that will answer these questions. I mean, do you think that the answer, I mean, will serve string theory or not? Well, I have no prejudice about that. Mm -hmm. I, if I had to bet, but I'm not sure this is true, I would have said that the research being done today in string theory is a step in the right direction, and it will lead to an answer to this question. When will it happen? happen, I have no idea. Okay. It could be that this will happen tomorrow. Somebody is writing it, writing a paper now and doing it. But it could also be that it will take 50 years. I doubt it would take, it could take longer than that, but I doubt it would take that long. So I think- uh, So probably I... not in my lifetime, but in the lifetime of most of the people in the audience will probably know the answer. 
So, uh, Professor, maybe uh, now, as I said, we close the gate, I mean, for the question about time, but uh, for the history of the universe, I mean, as you discussed, I mean, you mentioned Big Bang, but even now, the, this community of theoretical physicists, I mean, in many approaches addressing quantum gravity, when they change their mind about uh, is time fundamental or emergent, they change also their mind about uh, the starting point of the universe. I mean, most of the model, cosmological models right now, I mean, don't, I mean, uh, really believe that there is a really big bang. Uh, for example, the work of uh, Penaros with um, uh, the, uh, I mean, CC, C, uh, I mean, model, which is the conformal cosmological uh, uh, mm -hmm. model. Or other, I mean, uh, for example, um, uh, Neil Turok also has uh, something. So, so what do you think about, in string theory, of course, do you think, do you believe that there is a starting point of the universe or also you change your mind as the other physicists did? Well, science is not about my mind, you know, what I think or what somebody else thinks. Science is about reality. And we gather evidence in this direction. And where my prejudice goes is only in which direction I'm going to put my end. I can assure you that my prejudice has no impact on the right answer. The right answer exists. This is the difference between science and some ideas in the humanities. It, this is not something that is being decided by a group of elite scientists. This is something that nature decides it is the correct answer. And we as scientists try to understand nature. You can ask what I think is going to happen. My feeling now is that there was a big bang, there was an origin, and at least for the universe that we see around us, we know exactly when, we know when it happened, something like 14 billion years ago. And what happens at very short times, we also have a, quite a detailed understanding is as we go to shorter and shorter times, when the universe was younger and younger, at some point our understanding breaks down. And as we make more, for more research and we get more data, our understanding will improve eventually we'll understand the whole story, starting from time equals zero, where at time equals zero, the notion of time doesn't really exist. So it's only when the universe was time of a fraction old, there's something that looks approximately like time. This is the hope that we currently have. We cannot prove that this is right. We do not know how it works. We hope that in the future, somebody, maybe one of the young people here in the audience, will be able to flash it out and turn it into a much more complete and coherent story. Okay. So um, one of other things, I mean, which I contemplate on the market right now, when we say the market or the fashion of doing theoretical physics right now, there is um, a big uh, interest, I mean, rise in uh, last years about, I mean, um, transversal wormholes. I mean, um, which is some people like starting by um, uh, Einstein, Rosen, Bridge, then after that, I mean, the work of uh, Kip Thorne, which turned this, I mean, this object, this uh, cosmic object, wormholes to time machines. But after that, they proved that th those things are unstable and you need a, a, a negative mass, I mean, to make these panels stable but uh, these questions i mean they are closed about these things but recently um uh, people like saskin like juan maldesina like also the other i mean um uh, the community of lqg like carlo rovelli and ashtika start working about this transversal wormholes and trying to neglect or cancel this idea of stability associate with negative mass. So what I can't tell you because you are in the string theory, I mean, community and also one of um, IAS members. Um, so uh, why this interest 
I mean, uh, of this uh, cosmic objects, I mean, return back, I mean, um, to, uh, right. to the market. Like, as I said, the work of Juan Maldesina and the others. Do you think that this might be, I mean, uh, uh, helpful to change, as I said, the notion of time may, or maybe help us for the, uh, the, the merging of uh, GR and uh, quantum mechanics? Uh, first, I should qualify and say that I'm not an expert in this. Um, I, my understanding of these ideas is rather superficial. It sounds to me extremely exciting and very interesting and definitely something that should be pursued. It's, I think there's no question that it's not fully yet, not yet fully understood. And I, as an well, outsider, understand it even less than the people who work on it. So from an outsider perspective, it's very exciting, very interesting, but I'm not an expert in the details. So I'll probably leave it at okay. that. So now I think we go to your, I mean, uh, your specialty, which is, uh, I mean, supersymmetry and supersymmetry gauge field theories. I, I said the first bunch of the questions is for the audience. And after that, we go, I mean, for your um, I mean, uh, works, so the old one or the recent one. So um, first, uh, for string theory, uh, we know that we need some extra mathematical machinery like uh, extra dimension and supersymmetry. And um, supersymmetry that uh, they started, I mean, uh, for example, Wes and Zimino in early time, I mean, by doing like mathematically, I mean, that there is some symmetry between fermions and, um, and bosons. And also, I mean, going beyond the no-go uh, theorem and other things. So do you think that supersymmetry is a necessity uh, I mean, for describing the laws of nature. Okay, so when we discuss supersymmetry, we discuss several different things with different goals in mind, and we should really keep these goals separate. And the answer I would give to your question depends on which of these goals you're interested in. Goal number one was that supersymmetry turned out to be helpful in addressing the question known as the hierarchy problem. This is a problem with the stability of the mass of the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was discovered at the LHC. It had been predicted about 50 years earlier by Higgs and Angler and others. The theory was understood and the particle was discovered experimentally around 2012 or so at the LHC, the Hadron Collider at the laboratory called CERN. And there is a theoretical question about the stability of the mass of the Higgs. And supersymmetry was suggested to give us a solution or an answer to this question. As part of the solution, it predicted the whole slew of particles with masses of the order of several hundred GeV or so. The accelerator, the experiment, looked for these particles, and they are not there. It could be that they are still a little bit heavier than the reach of the machine, and they will be discovered in the near future. But as the time passes and the particles are not there, I'm no longer that convinced that they would be there. This is one application of supersymmetry. The second application of supersymmetry is that it appears to be essential for the consistency of strength. This is totally unrelated of whether it exists in, in the Hadron Collider or not, whether it's visible at one TeV or 100 GeV, or maybe it's visible only at the Planck scale, which is 10 to the 19th GeV. But it, it seems like supersymmetry is an essential ingredient in string theory, hence the name superstring theory. And we do not know how to formulate string theory to the extent that we understand it, without supersymmetry. So this is a totally different uh, motivation to be interested in supersymmetry. Okay. Now, my work was on a totally different aspect, the third aspect of supersymmetry. And this, the goal was to understand better how quantum field theory works. And quantum field theory is a very complicated system. It's very difficult to perform calculations. 
there are lots of schemes that allow us to perform approximate calculations, but we didn't know whether the approximate calculations are good or bad, whether the approximation is valid or not. It turns out that if you consider special kinds of field theories, field theories which have this symmetry, supersymmetry, in these theories, you can actually perform exact calculation. Once you perform exact calculation, you immediately learn a lot about the dynamics of the field. An example is it's very common in physics. We have a complicated system. We don't know how to analyze. We perform an approximation. Sometimes the approximation is good. Sometimes the approximation is bad. We don't know whether the approximation is useful or not. But once we have a system that we can solve it exactly, like the harmonic oscillator, the hydrogen atom, and many others, we learn a lot from the solution. Because we cannot say the solution is approximate, and therefore we're not sure, and maybe we like some aspect of it, but we don't like it. Here we get the full answer. Uh, here we get the full answer. So having exact answers is very, very helpful. And it turns out that field theories, which have supersymmetry, are amenable, give us exact answers to many questions. And that teaches us a lot about the structure of quantum field. Now, if that had been the only thing, that would be very interesting. Theoretically, this, by the way, also has a lot of implications to mathematics, which is another direction where supersymmetry is important. But this is unrelated to the question of whether supersymmetry is or is not discovered at the LHC. So when people say, is supersymmetry real? As a mathematical construct, it's definitely true. As a mathematical construct, it's definitely useful. It even has impact on other questions in mathematics that have nothing to do with supersymmetry, but by adding supersymmetry, you shed light. Whether it's also realized in nature in the TV range of energy, that's a separate question that might or might not be the case. Personally, I now think it's not very likely, but it's not impossible. Whether it exists at the Planck scale in the context of, uh, whether it exists in the Planck scale in the, in the context of string theory, I think it's quite likely to be the case. So when you ask me, is it real or not? It depends what you mean. And I hope I answered your question. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Now I think uh, we can go if uh, for the audience, I mean for the public audience. Now, if I will use some technical mathematical words, so uh, please uh, maybe they can forgive me because as I said, maybe now we can go to some uh, contribution of Professor Nathan Seiberg. So now, a Professor, um, in, uh, for example, uh, Institute of Advanced Study members, when they started, I mean, uh, string theory, I mean, uh, it looked like each, uh, uh, I mean, uh, members or bunch of people, I mean, th think uh, differently. I mean, I give you an example. Now, for example, Nimar, Kani Hamid, and uh, Malda Sena thinking about, I mean, uh, com uh, computing scattering amplitudes or using ads -CFT correspondence or solving problems in QCD or QFT using ads -CFT correspondence. Um, uh, Professor. Yeah, I'm here. I can hear you. I think we lost him. Maybe other we're facing theory? some internet connection difficulties with Dr. Akram. He's still with us on Zoom, but we cannot hear him. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure, sure. Ah, so I mean, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, till we get Dr. Akram again, I think we can ask, uh, take some questions from the audience. We can start with the Professor Basil Tai. Please, Professor. Yeah. It's an honor to have you, Nathan, and uh, to listen to uh, what you have said. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, uh, concerning the semi-classical approach, considering quantum field theory in curved space-time, I have worked during the second half of the 70s uh, in Manchester University with uh, Dauker, 
Steve Waddauker on quantum field theory in uh, Einstein, field, Einstein universe at finite temperature. And uh, we published a couple of papers in Physical Review D. Uh, one of them was uh, the calculation of the vacuum energy with finite temperature corrections. And uh, we believe that we have reached uh, some sort of a, a model, you can say. You can, you, can say, you can say it's a toy model, but nevertheless, uh, ha having a static model and having a static state of the universe represented by the Einstein universe, we could have imagined several static or stationary, so to speak, states. Uh, at the present time, I find new papers appearing talking about the stationary state, considering the universe as a stationary state. So my first question is, do you think that uh, the, the quantum field theory uh, in care of space-time as a semi-classical approach should have been given more space, more, more chance to present itself? Uh, uh, instead of going lost in the in the uh, uh, new development of string theory and other things, including inflation theory, etc. The second question is concerning the quantization of time. Uh, uh, since the work of uh, Don Page in nineteen Don Page and Wouters. Uh, in 1983, there were a new development now about the considering or reconsidering the page approach uh, and identifying the intrinsic time as a quantum, uh, as being measured by a quantum clock. Uh, don't you think that this approach is, is much nearer to nature I mean, it's more natural approach, especially with the new papers which appeared in 1919. Uh, since 1917, there were several papers on this subject, developing further the approach of Page and Wouters. Uh, do you think that this, ha this is more natural to approach the, the question of quantum gravity uh, through this uh, approach or not? Well, I can give you a very quick answer. I'm not familiar with the two things you mentioned, and therefore I cannot judge whether it will be more or less because I simply don't know what they are. And I took a note here, I'll look at that, and if I have anything useful to say, I'm I'll... sorry. <laughs> Hello, Professor, again. I am sorry it was, uh, I mean, uh, a technical problem on the internet. So as I said, do you hear me? Let me just finish answering this question and then we uh -huh, can okay. Yeah. Okay. So well, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately, I do not know much about that. And this is also not the kind of things that I have been working on. So I'm not familiar with it. I'm willing to look at these papers, and if I have anything useful to say, I can find your email address and send you an email. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is that sometimes things are kind of flying dormant. People write very interesting papers, and for some reason, they, these papers do not attract attention. And eventually, they become interesting, and people discover them. And sometimes they become interesting, not quite in the original context that was suggested, but in a different context. This is much more fluid and dynamical. When we discuss science, this is a general comment. There are things that are fully understood, are completely correct. They have been streamlined and we understand them. That's wonderful. The thing at the edge, are not quite so clear and there's a lot of confusion in their papers and papers that are being ignored and papers that are being discovered and the situation is more fluid. And then people don't have clear cut answers. They don't have clear cut answers. And I, on general grounds, if some work is good, it's time will come. It might take longer, it might be shorter, it's time will come. 
and people will appreciate it. Sometimes it will, this can happen in many different ways. And I've seen that many times in my old age. I've seen papers written, attracted no attention. 10 years later, people realize, wow, this was a great paper. So it's hard to tell about the specific two examples that you mentioned, I'm not familiar with them, but I look at them and if I have anything useful to say, I'll send you, I took down your name, I'll find your email address and I'll send you a response. Yeah, Nathan, ironically, ironically, our paper of 1978 is still in citation to 2020 <laughs> until now, uh, which makes me feel sometimes when I read the, the reviews and the papers, the recent papers, I feel that there is something uh, 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 that peoples are lost in the mist, uh, so to speak. They are lost in the mist of, of mostly of, of complicated mathematics sometimes, and sometimes in the confusing, as you said, confusing fundamental ideas with uh, artifacts of theories. You know, there are something fundamental and there are things which, you know, artifacts of theories. Uh, we are lost in the mist. Uh, uh, that's why you see a paper of 1978 being mentioned or cited in, in recent works, but it doesn't realize, they don't take it to realize the whole scope of the approach. By Give it time. Means. Give it time. Give it time. And if there is something there, eventually, Justice will prevail. Yeah, that's, that's my view. Justice will prevail. And sometimes people are written, people yeah, write papers, and the papers are completely ignored. And the author is very frustrated. The author says, I've already done it. It's all in my paper. And somehow it's being ignored. So it's, justice is not perfect, like in everything in life. But if the paper is not lost, and people still cite it, people are still aware of it. Eventually, somebody will read it and will say, look, here is an interesting insight in this paper that we ignored until now. Now we shouldn't ignore it. This could very well happen. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Professor Nathan. Thank you, Professor Basel. Back to Dr. Akram to continue the interview part. Yes, Dr. Akram. The stage is yours. Thank you so much uh, also for Professor Basel. I mean, hello, Professor. It is a great honor for me to have you, I mean, with us, and thank you so much. Um, uh, so you are, feel free, I mean, to, uh, to ask or maybe for, uh, I mean, uh, for discussion with Professor Nathan. Thank you so much. Thank so, you. Uh, so Professor uh, Nathan, I mean, uh, as I uh, discussed, I mean, um, there is uh, a, var a variety, I mean, in, I, I, um, in Institute for Advanced Study members, I mean, some of them work in ADSCFT, some of uh, them working in scattering amplitudes, some of them right now try to uh, find um, uh, a connection between advanced mathematical tools like Edward Witten, uh, between, for example, no theory and Kovanov homology and gauge theories. But you, I mean, you are unique because you are, you, you start, I mean, uh, with uh, super symmetry gauge theories and uh, uh, about dualities. So my first question about these things, why did you, have, did you choose this path? I mean, not the other ones. I mean, why this special things about supersymmetric gauge field theories and dualities? Okay. So I've worked on supersymmetry and duality for a long time. And for the last several years, I've actually been interested in other topics. And currently I am very interested in the connection between quantum field theory and various phenomena in condensed matter physics. And in particular, there are various dualities, similar to the dualities that exist in supersymmetric theory, but exist also in systems that are of interest in condensed matter physics. And more recently, I became interested in a phenomenon known as fractals. These are very peculiar systems that were discovered by people in quantum information theory, but also condensed matter physics, and they behave like, and they behave 
unlike any other system we have seen before. And my goal here is to try to understand these systems using the language and the tools of field theory that, <clears throat> that we know is the right language and right tool to address similar questions. It turns out that these systems do not fit the standard framework. And the, I'm personally in trying to think how we could fit them in that framework. But we talked before about things that are fully understood and things that are kind of still messy and are not completely understood. This is something that I've been working on for the last two years. So this is even less understood. And it might very well be that this whole effort is totally misguided. But in any event, this is what I've been thinking about. So personally, I'm no longer working on supersymmetric field theories, although I'm still interested. There's still a lot of activity out there and I follow it, but personally, I'm not working on it now. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm giving no guarantee that I will not come back. Mm -hmm. I might very well change my mind and go back to that, but at the moment I'm not thinking about it. Yeah. So when we discuss also about, well, for example, string theory, um, as you know, I mean, they start with the bosonic one. I mean, uh, uh, the bosonic string theory, then we goes to uh, what's called super string theory. Then we goes, I mean, to the unifications, use the S and T and U duality. But you, I mean, you are one of the people who think about the S duality, which is uh, the strong weak coupling duality. I mean, in different way. I mean, you didn't just use it in string theory, but also you are you, you, you were use it. I mean, in quantum field theory or engage um, uh, theories. So um, when you uh, initiate or you create the um, what uh, known known by cyber duality, which is S duality between two different uh, QCDs. So um, um, if you have an RG flow, so uh, if you have two, uh, I mean, a qu a quantum chromodynamics with S, U, N, um, I mean, uh, gauge symmetries and the C, so S, U, N, C, which is scalars, with N F flavors and um, uh, or uh, uh, fundamental uh, flavor multiplets, and uh, you prove that in uh, I mean the R G flow, which is a normalization group flow. I mean they uh, uh, goes and reach or flow to the same uh, E R uh, I R uh, fixed point. So why did you see such kind of using S dualities, not in string theory, but in N, in, uh, N equal to one uh, uh, supersymmetric gauge theories, and I mean, invent such kind of beautiful, I mean, uh, dualities uh, between uh, two different QCDs? So the question is why it is there or why I thought it was there? Well, no, why, why did you, uh, I mean, uh, start thinking differently about S duality uh, outside of string theory? Well, you got the, the dates wrong. This was a before S duality in string theory. That was, his, my paper was in 94. And the duality revolution happened in 95. Yes, I know. But as so I it's said, not that this thing action. existed and I decided to go and change it. I didn't follow the historical, I mean, chronological ordering, but I just, I ask in general. So, so as I said, yeah. yeah. So I was trying to understand what these theories do. These theories like QCD labeled by the number of colors and flavors. And as I said earlier, and I realized that if we only make the system supersymmetric, we can compute things exactly. That was the new insight, that with supersymmetry, some objects can be computed exactly, whereas without supersymmetry, we cannot compute these objects at all. And I started computing it for very, various objects and various theories. And then I discovered uh, this fact that these two theories are the same. Oh, okay. I was motivated by understanding, I wasn't motivated by understanding duality, I was motivated by understanding the theories. Then I discovered that they have this property called duality. Okay. So and that was not, it was before the duality revolution in string theory. 
Africa. So now the other contribution I, I started, I mean, uh, discussing about cyber duality, then we move, I mean, to one of also big contribution uh, or scientific achievement, which is cyber within theory. So um, you are using an, in, uh, an equal to uh, supersymmetric gauge field theories and you, you use, I mean, um, uh, you try to determine uh, the low effective action for such gauge theories, N equal to two. And um, at the vacua, I mean, um, at the vacua of this uh, gauge, uh, supersymmetric gauge field theories, I mean, it's, we know that it's Kahler uh, uh, model uh, spaces. So, um, and after that, you find uh, the exact solutions or exact actions, uh, which is instant and, and the other things. So why did you interest about, uh, about N equal to two? Because the vacua, uh, the moduli space of the vacua is Kahler space and the Kahler space is a manifold with three uh, 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 compatible structure, which is symplectic form and uh, uh, what's called Riemannian forms plus uh, the uh, complex form. So it's a unique, or uh, what's your motivation? I mean, to start with- so As I said, I, I realized earlier that once we make field theory super symmetric, more things are calculable. Mm. That, that was the, and then I didn't have any grand vision. I just thought that I have a new tool. I will apply it wherever I can. So I tried to apply it to all sorts of theories and use the symmetries of this every particular example. And from the perspective that I came from, I just wanted to understand any more theories and do what, see what they do with the N equals two theory was a particular example that uh, Whitney and I worked on. Now, Whitney was much more interested in this theory, was interested in this theory also because it's connected to mathematics. But I didn't understand the connection to mathematics, nor was it my motivation. My motivation was to understand the dynamics of your theory. And this particular theory is interesting because it sheds light on confinement. It explains how the mechanism of confinement takes place, which is something that exists also without supersymmetry, without supersymmetry in confinement in QCD in the real world. And in this theory, we can see the quite explicitly. So this is what motivated me because I just wanted to understand more theories. I, I did not have any grand vision about, you know, finding duality in N equals two and having the application in mathematics. I had none of that. I'm very happy that it happened, but that was not my vision. No, for me, uh, there is, as I said, as you know, in supersymmetry gauge field theories, there is many, I mean, liars. There is a priorities, for example, N equal to four super young means theories. There is N equal to eight in supergravity. So, but N equal to one or maybe N equal to one is the minimal supersymmetry gauge, uh, gauge field theories, but N equal to two. I mean, um, my mind was going to that Kahler manifold, um, which is, I mean, uh, the vacua. Uh, model space of this kind of gauge supersymmetric field theories is uh, unique because it is a compatible or uh, is equipped with It seems again we face difficulties with internet connection with Dr. Akram. Okay. In that case, we can back to our audience questions. Mr. Karim. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello, Professor Nathan. Uh, I, I, let me introduce myself at the first. I am a second year physics undergraduate student at Zawil City of Science and Technology in Egypt. And uh, I'm grateful for this, uh, for this talk. I have listened to some of the lectures that you, that are put on the YouTube platform in which you have uh, um, uh, conceived some of the ideas in fundamental physics and uh, where fu the fundamental physics as uh, 
the this term has been coined by the physicists uh, is leading us and how the quantum field theory which is a fancy name of course uh, is a fundamental framework in which uh, physics is put uh, and in which many interesting developments are happening so i have uh, some questions uh, the first is that uh, quantum field theory, uh, the theory that has been put by people like uh, Feynman, Timonaga, Schwenger, and Dyson, is very successful. That's, that's okay. But the problem is that, as you may know, in the, uh, after studying some of the history of science, you will find that the methods of Jolly and Schwenger uh, is is abundant in theoretical physics, or or, or that's what I'm uh, hearing from all of my professors at the university. They are telling me that Feynman Feynman rules and uh, way of thinking is the prevailing one. But uh, when I got to to one of the professors to ask him about. And what, what's, what about the Schwinger's method of uh, doing quantum field theory? So I'm asking, why does that happen? Why did that happen? Uh, that's my first question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can answer that. So sure, the Schwinger approach and the Feynman approach are essentially the same. And by now, there are more modern ways of thinking about them, phrasing them, teaching them, and understanding them. And there are also calculation of schemes, which are more powerful than existed at the time. Having said that, they are limited to what is known as perturbation theory. They are valid when there's a coupling constant, and the coupling constant is small and we compute things in the power series expansion. And the Feynman rules tell us how to compute things in order by order in this uh, power series expansion. Most of the interest in field theory is not in this perturbation expansion, but in non-perturbative effects. This is where much more interesting phenomena take place, right? confinement, duality, phenomena that the coupling constant is very strong. Of course, the coupling constant is not a small number and therefore expanding in a power series in the coupling constant is not the valid thing to do. So the, there's huge literature on the subject. This is something that has been studied for decades. The work of Feynman and Monaga, when was it 50 or 60 years ago, mm -hmm. And a lot has happened since then. Now it's even more than that. A lot has happened since then. So I would suggest you study the more modern papers or the more modern books about quantum field theory if you're interested in that. Or take courses if there are courses on YouTube or courses in your university. There are lots of lectures and books and you can learn the material if you're interested. Okay, okay. Professor. Another question. Yes, Professor. Professor Nathan. No, there was, there was another question that uh, the student asked. He said he has two questions and I answered the first one. I think it's better to postpone it until the first part ah, with Dr. Okay. Akram finished, since okay. Dr. Akram is with us now. So, Dr. Akram, can you hear me? Maybe, yes. Yes, your uh, stage is yours. Yes, okay. So, Professor Nathan, because uh, as I said, there is also big names here. I mean, in the Arabic community, I, I mean, maybe I will add just one or two questions, and I will allow to some names because we have um, here head of departments, we have big theoretical physicists, and I am very shy that I will uh, skip their contributions. So, um, 
maybe I will just add one or two questions. I just continue, as I said, I was thinking that the special about your contribution in N equal to two super um, uh, symmetric gauge uh, field theories is was uh, about the vacua of uh, the model space, which is Kahler manifold and Kahler manifold is a special unique manifold equipped with three forms, symplectic forms, Riemannian forms, and uh, uh, complex forms, but you tell me that uh, um, it's another, I mean, motivation, it's not pure mathematics and contributions. So now just- Let, let, let me just, sorry for interrupting. Yes. The metric on the moduli space of Aqua was something I was interested in. And it is indeed one of, as I said, in supersymmetric theories, there are more things we can compute exactly than in non-supersymmetric. And the new thing about N equals two was that we can compute that metric. Such metric exists already for N equals one, but there it's not computed. It is computable for N equals two. So that was also one of the motivations to study the N equals two theory. We get a formula for this metric. So I just wanted to correct uh, this notion. So. The more supersymmetries we add, there's n equals one or n equals two or n equals four. The more supersymmetries we have, the more powerful is the supersymmetry and the more we can compute. But on the flip side of that is that the phenomena are, that can be com computed for these objects are much less interesting because they're much more constrained by supersymmetry. So n equals two was kind of a sweet spot where there is this metric, it is non-trivial and it is computable. In n equals four, this metric is trivial. In n equals one, this metric is not computable. So if you're interested in the metric, n equals two is the best place. You can compute it and it's non -trivial. Uh, professor, I think, I mean, I didn't go to the technicality, I mean, due to the audience, I know that um, maybe use you and Edward within the duality between, I mean, holography and uh, 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 homolo, uh, homolography, yes, and uh, um, magne um, yeah, yeah, and uh, 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 yes and magnetic uh, effects and um, this duality, when you use this uh, duality, I mean, and use some uh, localization method of uh, Nikita Nekrasov, uh, you put constraint of um, the Kahler prepotential, then you go, um, am I right about these things or? Yeah, you're completely right. So yeah, you're completely right that there are constraints coming from supersymmetry and they allow you to determine all these things. So uh, another question about, this is a general question about maybe for the graduate students or, so when do, uh, do you have, for example, two theories have the same symmetries and the same toothed anomalies? So what's the benefit from this? I mean, when you have two theories have the same symmetries and the same toothed anomalies. So what's the application of this thing? As, it's, as it stands, it could be just a coincidence, or it could be that these two theories could be deformed into one another, or they could even be the same theory. So all three options are possible. And without more information, we cannot give a general answer. Wow. So again, it could be that the two, this means that the two, the two theories are the same, they only look different, and therefore they have the same symmetries and the same anomalies. Or it could be that they're not exactly the same, but they, we can deform one of them to the other. Or it could be that they have nothing to do with each other. This is just a coincidence. Okay. So uh, another thing about supersymmetry, I think uh, we discussed about the importance of the symmetry, which is some people thinking about that. This is a God principle in theoretical physics. But also uh, when we discuss, I mean, last time with Cameron Vapa, he discussed about the importance of symmetry principle and about also the spontaneous symmetry breaking of those symmetries. For example, Susie breaking, we know that uh, one of the important things about Susie breaking is to um, uh, maybe 
minimize the fine tuning of, uh, of the uh, vacuum energy, I mean, which is the cosmological constant problem. So when we try, I mean, to uh, cancel out this factor or uh, from the Hilbert Einstein actions, I mean, you need the symmetry. And when you use, I mean, the, the supersymmetry, you need to, um, to find a, a level of supersymmetry breaking because at the level of supersymmetry, you have the fermionic and the bosonic uh, uh, Feynman diagrams of the vacuum cancel out, and you will find that the vacuum of the empty, um, the energy of the empty space is zero. So you need the uh, uh, the breaking of such symmetry. Then uh, I mean we uh, try to minimize this fine tuning. So what's the other application or deep fundamental application of the SUSY breaking? Okay, so. The main application for SUSY breaking, so I mentioned these different motivations for supersymmetry. So one of them was to find supersymmetry to stabilize the mass of the Higgs. Now, if we look at nature around us, supersymmetry is not there. We don't see bosons and fermions with the same mass. This tells us that this beautiful symmetry, supersymmetry, cannot be exact, must be broken somehow. So understanding supersymmetry breaking is essential in order to explain, in order to write models or to find an answer of why bosons and fermions don't have the same mass in the real world. And that's only in the direction of applying supersymmetry in the TV range of energies. It's unrelated to the question of using supersymmetry to analyze field theories exactly like in the discussion we had about n equals one or n equals two or n equals four. So in end, the models most interested for understanding dynamics and perform calculations exactly, for example, you mentioned with n equals one, two and four, these models are models for supersymmetry is unbroken. For the application TV range physics, the most interesting models, some models for supersymmetry is broken. So within this big field of supersymmetry, as I said, there are several different motivations and any one of them can be, it has its own merits and can be thought of in its own right. And the question of supersymmetry breaking is important in the context of explaining supersymmetry in the TV range not in the context of uh, using supersymmetry as a tool to perform exact calculation. Okay, Professor, thank you. Uh, so for me, last questions, and as I said, maybe I will give uh, open the floor for um, other professors, I mean, and the audience. So um, I, I don't know if you are, familiar or you are interested or motivated with the last work of the fun of his work um, or his contribution and finding connection between uh, a not theory, Jean Polynomials, and uh, what's called uh, the uh, quantum mechanics. So um, what we see as Feynman path integrals or those paths, which for example, a particle goes from A to B, those, I mean, uh, possible uh, them like as um, uh, nodes and they associate John polynomials for them. So then uh, this is um, mathematics. Uh, so if we go to um, give those nodes more physics, I mean, uh, we can go to Kovanov homology and other things. I mean, do you think that this path also is very interesting? I know that uh, before there is contribution of uh, Edward Witten for uh, taking, for example, Shen, uh, finding some connection between Shen, Simon, I mean, uh, or topological field theories and uh, the gauge, uh, I mean, field theories. And it was, I mean, Shen, Simon, gravity, uh, and other uh, things like uh, West Zimino, Witten, uh, Shen, Simon, and duality. So, I am discussing about Kovanov homology right now. Do you think that this path is, uh, I mean, has some benefit uh, in string theory or answering some deep questions or just this uh, mathematical tools or some path? I mean, uh, we don't know what's kind Again, of- Again, this is not something I'm an expert in. 
but as an outsider, it looks extremely interesting. And it has always been the case that when something is good, good science has applications beyond the original motivation. So many times you do something for one purpose and it turns out to be good for other reasons. My favorite example is Newton inventing calculus and calculus has applications everywhere, far beyond Newton's original motivation. And the same thing is true here. This is beautiful physics, beautiful mathematics, beautiful connection between mathematics and physics. And I'm sure it will have more applications beyond those that have already been discussed. Now, I'm not an expert in that, so I wouldn't predict what, what they would be. I think even if I'd been an expert, I would not be able to predict it, but definitely given that I'm not an expert. So, um, Professor, for me, thank you so much. I think we discussed about um, a lot of questions about necessity of unification, about string theory, about time, about arrow of time, about, I mean, uh, your contribution, cyber duality, uh, cyber within, uh, uh, I mean, theory. Uh, about um, a lot of things. So I, I think we have, as I said, a lot of uh, people here. Maybe um, for you, for me, I am done. So uh, for me, thank you so much, Professor Nathan. So maybe uh, for, I will um, uh, first, uh, Ahmed, I will uh, please, if you can. So uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Habib Isawi and uh, Professor uh, 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 Saidi and uh, also uh, for Karim, please ask Professor uh, Shaban Khalil. I mean to enter because he is out now, and also Professor Basil Tai. So those big names. I mean, I hope that there is will be maybe questions or discussions. So this is Professor our big names in the Arab community. So um, one from Egypt, the other from Iraq, uh, the other one in Algeria. So I am happy maybe to hear from them. So we start maybe, um, maybe if he want to talk with um, Habib Aysawi, if he want. Professor. Professor, if you can, if you hear me, uh, Aysawi, you can open. Uh, um, uh, in, uh, I mean, your uh, mic, and if maybe you can discuss with professor or uh, ask your questions, please. Else, I mean, we can go to Professor Saidi. Uh, good evening, thank you. Maybe here in Morocco is uh, nice. Thank you for this uh, nice presentation. Thank you, Nathan, for all these uh, uh, for the presentation, I mean, through many ideas. I would like to ask you a question, if you can give a brief comment on topological quantum matter in condensed matter physics and connection with uh, quantum field theory, if you can give your comments and uh, if you think that there will be some thing in this direction. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the question. I, I think this is an absolutely beautiful discovery, which by now exists both experimentally and theoretically. It's a beautiful subject in field theory. It's a very nice confluence of ideas from condensed matter physics and high energy physics, including motivation partly from string theory. And it might even have technological application. So this is the hallmark of what great science is because it exists experimentally. It is, there were experimental discoveries in the context of the whole effect. There was a mathematical framework using topological field theory, trans-Simons theories and related things. A lot of other developments in condensed matter physics merging together into looking for more experimental examples. And at the moment, people try to use some of these ideas. It's not clear whether they will succeed or not, also for technology. 
in particular, people think of using top materials about the topological phases of matter to build the quantum computer. And if they succeed, this will be a huge technological advance, really huge. This will make all the computers we know about totally, totally obsolete, totally obsolete. This, the technological application hasn't happened yet. Many people are working on it, but this is a typical example. It's not typical, unfortunately, but this is an example of how we have confluence of ideas from experiment, from different theory in, in more mathematical side, quantum field theory, theoretical condensed matter physics, and all of them come together toward one goal. So this is a fantastic chapter in physics, and I have no doubt that this chapter in physics will continue to be exciting in the future. So I'm very glad you brought it up. In fact, I alluded to this earlier when I said that there are interesting connections between condensed matter physics and quantum field theory. And there are really three sides here. There's condensed matter physics, quantum field theory as high energy physicists think about it, and pure mathematics. And these three fields constantly influence each other. And personally, I believe that there will be a lot more excitement in this interface between condensed matter physics, high energy physics, and mathematics. And the example you mentioned of topological phases of matter is the hallmark of where these things happen. Professor Said, did you have Th other questions? Thank or? you very much. Thank you. OK. Uh, by the way, Professor Nathan Seiberg, because you are maybe new to the Arabic world, uh, Professor Hassan Saidi is, I mean, uh, the head of theoretical physics group. He's a string theoricist and um, one of uh, the big names, I mean, in Arab community in string theory. He's based on Morocco right now in uh, um, uh, Muhammad V, I think, uh, University in Rabat, just, uh, I mean, uh, to introduce him. So thank you, Professor Saidi, again. So uh, now maybe we have other questions. I mean, as I said, um, from uh, Saeed Sabah or Professor uh, Basil Tai. If you have Professor also Basil Tai, so you can open the mic. We have honor, I mean, to have you with us also. Yeah, I just want to add one uh, comment, uh, further comment. Uh, okay, I wonder if uh, Professor Nathan uh, knows that uh, uh, the Bose-Einstein condensation, which is a low temperature phenomena in uh, condensed matter physics, turns out to be a high temperature phenomena when it is brought to cosmology. I have one uh, paper uh, published long ago about uh, Bose-Einstein condensation in uh, curved space-time where we find that the critical temperature, uh, the critical temperature for the Bose condensate to happen is uh, about uh, 10 to the power 32 Kelvin. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and uh, we have speculated, of course, about uh, whether uh, such a phenomena can uh, tell us uh, how the first particles were generated, were produced. Interesting. Uh, and indeed, there are some glimpses, you can say. It's not a full theory, certainly. It's more like uh, speculation with some mathematical uh, vindication, which shows, yes, indeed, that the critical temperature, this critical, at uh, this very critical temperature, uh, radiation, pure radiation that turned out to be, to become massive particles. And this is very interesting. It's, it's published in the Journal of Physics A, Mathematical and Physical, uh, uh, 2000, I think, and two, long time ago, a long time ago. Yeah. The second point, which I want to stress again, if you may allow me, is uh, the quantization of time. I feel the mistreatment of time in a quantum field theory and quantum mechanics 
and uh, not acknowledging <laughs> that time can become an operator or some kind of a, uh, a joint uh, uh, to the to the energy is a, uh, is hindering is 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 causing many problems in in um, all aspects of theoretical physics, uh, whether it be, it be in string theory or in, in, in even perhaps supersymmetry problems and the hierarchy problem will turn out to be solvable once we quantize time. What do you think about that, uh, Nathan? Well, I don't know much about it, so I, I don't know. Yeah. But I will look up your papers. It, it was the, looking at it. It was looking at it. Yeah, I'll definitely look at it and I'll see what I, I can see. Yeah. Well, there are some original papers by uh, Isher Paris, for example, the first one, which is rarely mentioned. Not rarely, but they mentioned them. Okay, thank but, you for pointing it out. I'll, I'll look it up. I, I remember I knew him. No, no, Paris. I have, I have written to him recently. He's still alive, actually. Yeah. He was the he was a student, I think, of Nathan Rosen. Yeah. Originally in 1959 or something. He was so. in the Technion in Israel. Yeah. And uh, we have some some communication recently, very recently, about this approach. And he is still of the opinion that uh, adapting or considering time as an intrinsic property of the quantum system. Measuring time through quantum clock will certainly pay off for mm -hmm. the development of new theories. Okay, thank you for pointing it out to me. I'll look at it. Yes. Thank you. So thank you so much, Professor uh, Vessel Tai again. So, so do you have, Professor, other, contribu um, other questions or uh, that's it for now, Professor? No, that's uh, it, I have. The... Okay. So now uh, we open for the audience. Uh, I mean, uh, any questions? So now for public or um, uh, others. So um, Professor Nathan is available. I mean, uh, so um, Ahmed, uh, he uh, is, um, I mean, uh, you can, I mean, ask the audience to raise hands and you can take some questions for Professor. Sure, Nathan. sure. Thank you, Dr. Akram. We have uh, an old question came from Sir Ayman. I'll Kabi, I think. No, no, no. Uh, yes. No. He is asking about how string theory differ from loop quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. String theory is a well explored theory with we don't fully understand it, but it's well explored by thousands of people for decades with a lot of success. A lot of success with impact first on other branches of science, math, physics, with a lot of promise because it has many of the ingredients that we see in the real world. And it's the consistency is beyond doubt. Look, quantum gravity is not that well developed. And I cannot begin to enumerate how on every front, it's not even, it, this, it's beyond comparison with string theory. The depth of the theory, the test that it was subjected to, and the interest that it attracts in the richness of the theory. So if I have to give an advice, I would say focus on string theory, because it looks much more promising. Sure, thank you, Professor Nathan. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Yusuf Abdel Mohaimen. By the way, who wants to ask, either can write his question on the chat box or can raise his hand or her hand to open the mic and um, say his or her question directly to Professor Nathan. So, Mr. Yusuf, if you still have a question, please. Hi. I can hear you. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, you suggest one thing. Please, if, um, uh, if you can open the camera, if you can, so um, maybe it will be better to interact with the professor. Sure. I mean, maybe he will be happy, I mean, with the audience. 
And please keep your question direct and short as much as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, Up to you. Mm. Yes, I hear you. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I have a question to Professor. Uh, can he and uh, can <clears throat> string theory describe uh, dark matter or dark energy? And how we can test the string theory or, or uh, what is the application of the string theory? Okay, so the quick answer is that we don't know on any one of these five fields. And I can go and elaborate some more. Dark matter, the prevailing view, but it might not be the right one, is that dark matter is some new kind of particle that exists in some energy about the reach of the current experiments. And there are searches going on to look for it experimentally. Once such a particle is discovered, we will have to add it to the standard model of particles. So all this is independent of string theory. Then there's another question of whether string theory can reproduce the standard model. And if there's also a particle of dark matter, can string theory reproduce not only the standard model of particle physics as we know it, but also this particle that is yet to be discovered and we're not even sure that it exists associated with dark matter. Dark energy uh, is a more complicated issue because it is intrinsically gravitational. So it's not a problem in field theory. This is an intrinsic problem in gravity. It's a term in the Hamiltonian, in the Lagrangian of gravity. And there is a question of whether string theory can or cannot accommodate such a cosmological constant of dark energy. Different people have different views on that. Some people think that it's possible. Some people think it's impossible. And at the moment, we do not yet, at the moment, we do not yet know. Then you ask me about tests of string theory. This is a broader question, not about specific items of whether string theory can produce or not, but more generally, is there a unique prediction of string theory that could prove that it's right or wrong? And at the moment, we do not have such a clear prediction. Oh, primarily, I believe, is because where spring theory becomes very springy, where all the spring effects are visible and large, that happens at very high energy, around the Planck scale, 10 to the 19 GeV. That current experiments are not even close to that. Energy. The best we have is, say, one TV, TV rate. One to ten TV, depending on how you count. The this discrepancy in distance, not a discrepancy, this barrier of exploring things in very short distances with very high energies is not going to be closed anytime soon. It's not that we just have to increase the reach of the accelerator a little bit and things will be your orders of magnitude far from. So where will the hope come? Where will the help come from? Where can we possibly get connection between theory and experiment? The honest answer is if I don't know, but we could think that somebody young and bright will come up with an idea. Maybe it will come from astrophysics, maybe it will come from cosmology, or maybe it will come from a clever experiment or a clever theory that would shed light on. As it stands now in 2021, we do not have an answer. Thank you, Professor Nathan. Mm -hmm. uh, we I have, yes, I have, I have another question. Yes, please. Uh, could string theory describe expansion of the universe? Mm -hmm. I believe the answer to that is yes, actually, because once you get, for that, you don't need the dark matter or the dark energy. It is just a solution of Einstein's equation. And as such, it is a solution of the last question, uh, uh, can string theory describe why the time run in one direction or the entropy? No, it, the whole question of time, which we discussed earlier in, when I responded to the question is a huge mystery. At the moment we postulate there is time and string theory can live with this time that we postulate. Ultimately, 
many of us believe that the idea of time will emerge as a new concept without being fed into the theory by him. But at the moment, this hasn't happened. Thank you. But for younger people Thank you. like you, I think all these questions should be fantastic because it's one thing to learn things that are already understood. And you, maybe if you're interested in science, you're very happy to learn things that are understood. But it's much, much more exciting to discover something new, something that is not yet understood. Yes. And this is where younger people have an opportunity. So all these questions that are well formulated, ready to be answered, answered, and all the scientists struggled with it and couldn't figure them out, is a fantastic opportunity for a young physicist to tackle the problem, solve it, and this would be an enormous achievement for the individual, but also for mankind. So you should view all these questions as challenges and opportunities rather than criticism or problems in the theory. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nathan. And thank you, Yusuf, for your great questions. We have a question from Dr. Nidal Salame. Dr. Nidal, could you please open the mic and ask your question directly? And if you can also open your camera, it would be great. Dr. Nidal, can you hear me? Okay, the question in the chat box is, is there any solution for that much math equations and less physical concepts? To be honest, I don't understand the question. Mm, actually, me too. <laughs> That's why I asked Dr. Nidal to help us to clarify the question. Maybe he is asking about the, uh, let's say, the formulas of string theory, it is more mathematical than physical. It is still abstract concept rather than experimental. So I, we I have, have to, yeah, yes. I, 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 it's a, I'm not sure it will address this question, but I'd like to make one point. Mm -hmm. I think the separation between math and physics is somewhat artificial. Mm -hmm. Centuries ago, there were no physicists and mathematicians. These were the same people doing both. And there was no clear distinction between them. Exactly. That has changed over time. And I believe that in the future, there will, on one hand, there will be more specialization. People will focus on one thing or another, just as they focus, say, on cosmology, and other people can focus on condensed matter physics, and other people can focus on some other topic. But there isn't really a clear separation between the different fields, and including also mathematics. So asking, is this math or is this physics? I think that this is not quite the right way because the, there isn't a clear separation between them. There has been a lot of cross fertilization between physics and mathematics. Physics influenced math, math influenced physics. And I believe that in the future, there will be even more of that to the point that there will be really be no boundary between these disciplines. Could we have boundaries between abstract and empirical sciences or also we shouldn't do that? I, I don't think we should have such, well, there are things that there's an experimentalist, I wouldn't enter the lab, I wouldn't know what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And maybe experimentalists would not know all the fancy abstract things. And different people know different things. It's impossible to know everything. But I don't think there's a clear dividing line between one activity and the other. Because there are many things that kind of straddle both. And there are people who imported ideas from one discipline to another. Mm -hmm. So you, would you say that they are in this discipline or the other discipline? Well, they are in both. And I don't think you should separate the disciplines. Okay, uh, for many people, a string theory is like a theory of everything. So if we consider this theory as a theory of everything, and we were able to understand all its aspects. 
So what's next? What we should do well, after finding the theory question. of everything? I'm glad you asked this question because I really do not like the phrase theory of everything. Mm -hmm. This is really misleading. Yes. This is really misleading and I can explain why. Mm -hmm. Over the centuries, physicists always try to understand more and more fundamental laws of nature, more and more fundamental concepts at shorter and shorter distances. This comes in philosophy under the name of reductionism. Reductionism is the idea that we go to shorter distances and there we find the true ingredients of matter. And then using these true ingredients, we can go back and explain phenomena at longer distances. Now, in many cases, this is true, but in many cases, going from the fundamental principles at short distances to the phenomena at longer distances is true in principle, but in practice is not, cannot be done. I mentioned earlier the examples of hydrodynamics with molecules bouncing around. That's the microscopic description. And I compare that with the macroscopic long distance description in terms of hydrodynamics. We know more or less how to go from one to the other, but it's not practical to use the microscopic description of all the molecules to describe the flow of water. Now the Stokes equation is much more powerful and much more effective. Most of physics is not this thing of finding more and more fundamental things. Most of physics is to use the known fundamental laws and derive new phenomena. So even if one day, 50 years, 100 years, we do understand the ultimate fundamental laws of nature, perhaps in the is in string theory, perhaps it would be a variant of it, and this would take more years or less years, by no means will this be the end of science. So the question of what will happen afterwards, well, there will be tons of things to do. Just look around you, the richness of nature, the riches of nature come from the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is relatively simple, but there's a long way from starting with the Schrodinger equation and explaining all the materials which we see around us. At least in principle, the Schrodinger equation allows us to describe life, but there's a long way from one to the other. So even if we understand the Schrodinger equation, this does not mean that we understand everything that follows from the Schrodinger equation. And similarly, once we understand quantum gravity and string theory and all these questions, what will happen is that this will be the ultimate reductionism. We'll find the ultimate short distance theory, but this will not be the end of science. There will still be a lot of things to understand. So when people talk about the end of science and this and that, I think this is just wrong. So science will have a lot to do for centuries to come. Okay, thank you, Professor. The last question is from Mr. Hussein Al Khaldi. Fadan. Yes, Mr. Hussein. Uh, welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, please, I uh, have one question, please. Uh, uh, why can't we move from local to global in general uh, relativity, please? What do you mean by from lo local, local, local motion, motion? I don't know what you mean, but in general relativity, we don't... Oh, yes, 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 yes. Right, so in, in general relativity, there are no local coordinate invariant observable. So the quickest way to answer your question is that we formulate the theory with a boundary and we formulate the question at the boundary. So for example, we can compute an estimate if we throw something in, we check what comes out. Quantities like the distance between observables and all that are much more subtle and some of them perhaps do not quite make sense. I hope that answered your question. Uh, no. question, just because uh, it was cut off. So, do you think that all the puzzles in theoretical physics, the actual puzzles, 
um, dark energy, the, uh, uh, the asymmetry between uh, uh, matter and antimatter. Um, uh, I mean, uh, um, all of the unifications or the quantum theory of gravity and all these puzzles. Do you think that they are all of them related and the key is the notion of time changing deeply, the notion of time from, as you said, from fundamental to emerge and figure out what's this sophisticated thing that, um, uh, that is the fundamental thing which time and space emerge for. Do you think that this is the key for solving all this? Problems? I don't know. It's definitely not the key for solving most questions. I think most questions can be uh, questions that are present independent of this, of what you just said. Uh, so we don't need to understand it in order to address all other questions. Having said that, understanding how space and time emerge will clearly enrich us and will clearly answer some questions. Yes. Uh, Professor, okay. when you said the emergence, uh, uh, this is the last point and uh, you, you can go ahead also. So. Uh, I think um, there are a lot of people now working on quantum entanglement. They think that maybe uh, we have uh, seen the world classically and all time we go from classical to quantum. So why we try to, um, uh, I mean, start, I mean, uh, in the other ways, so go from quantum to the classics. I mean, uh, maybe the quantum entanglement um, uh, I mean, it's the fundamental thing which space and time emerge or space time emerge from this notion. Do you uh, agree with those, um, I mean, uh, guys? Well, you're, you're asking me how things will evolve in research. And that yes. I yes. really cannot predict. And if I Not predict, if, even okay. if I go on the limb and I make a prediction, I can guarantee you that my prediction will end up being wrong because science is always so interesting, partly because we don't know where we're going. It's, that's why it's so interesting. And it constantly surprises us with the interesting twists and turns that it takes. So I cannot predict which research direction will lead to what. Which, I cannot predict which research direction is more productive than another. Oh, okay. Because my prediction will be wrong. Uh, professor, allow me, I mean, uh, th this is, and I am sorry for your time, I mean, because I uh, mentioned him and uh, he is, as I said, the director of uh, uh, Zwil City, uh, I mean, uh, in Cairo, Shaban Khalil. So please, Professor, if you can open your mic and uh, discuss with uh, Professor Martin Cyber, because he's, uh, I mean, his specialty is, I mean, close to uh, your uh, your. So Professor Khalil, if you hear me, so please uh, open the mic. Yes, thanks, Akram. Uh, I hope the internet now is stable. I really uh, missed some parts, but I enjoyed the parts which I listened in the beginning. And really, I would like to thank uh, uh, Cyborg for his uh, um, interesting discussion with our uh, colleagues and our uh, uh, students and uh, researchers and really uh, this type of meetings is very good really for uh, promoting um, science in general, physics in particular, high energy and fundamental physics in, uh, in, in really in particular, which we uh, need in our, uh, our, uh, our region. We need to promote it more and more. And I really appreciate the effort that uh, Akram is doing in organizing such uh, meeting and uh, getting uh, really great professors to uh, discuss with our uh, future uh, colleagues and our young uh, students. And as I said, the first part, which was almost one hour uh, in the beginning before my internet uh, really collapsed, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, it's really interesting discussions. I can't say I have a com any, any, any further comments or questions because as I said, it's really, um, very interesting discussions, 
motivated for uh, deep understanding and thinking about uh, future of our fundamental physics, where we can go. Uh, uh, I like the, the, the reply uh, Cyber mentioned about supersymmetry, since uh, I'm doing supersymmetry phenomenology at TV scale, and usually people are pessimistic about finding Susie uh, at low energy. Maybe this is, as he said, the nature will tell us it's not matter of our choice, it's the choice of the nature, it will be a pity. It's, it's a super simple, really wonderful theory, mathematically consistent theory is extension for the special theory of relativity and change it to local version. For the first time, we bring gravity to the game and we became, we, 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 we have something local gauge theory, which is gravity in super gravity theory, I mean, but still a TV scale is something to know if super uh, exists or not. But as um, mentioned, even if there is no Susie at TV scale, of course, LHC will not uh, refute uh, the, 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 the existence of uh, super symmetry or can prove, but never disprove because it could be at higher scales. And in this case, it is, it is not low energy uh, physics. And then we may lose the interest of supersymmetry in particle physics phenomenology, but supersymmetry by itself is interesting theory, valid at higher scales and, uh, you know, make th different theories. Uh, as he said, without supersymmetry, superstring maybe is difficult to, to, to construct. Without supersymmetry, inflations may be also difficult to, to, to have a kind of uh, elegant model for inflation. So I like uh, the, the, the comments he said, it depends on really when does you are looking for supersymmetry uh, uh, from and uh, and uh, and in general i enjoyed the discussions and the comments uh, uh, i didn't i didn't i missed the the, the questions and the discussion of uh, uh, our audience but uh, I, I was lucky that the internet at least gave me the chance to listen to the whole uh, the first one hour that it was mainly given by Cyberg, and uh, I really wish uh, the corona will uh, go away soon and we can invite you in Egypt, in Algeria and wherever, and we can have this type of meeting, physical meeting where we can discuss more and more. Uh, we already talked from your time two hours, but I hope it may be two years, two days later on, and this will be really quite interesting. So thank you very much. And I really uh, appreciate your uh, participation, your effort, your time, and also Akram uh, initiative really, which is really great. And I hope he will continue and we can have every couple of weeks, one of uh, really uh, prominent scientists to discuss with us uh, different topics in mainly fundamental physics. I'm sure Akram will not bring uh, any discussion apart from fundamental physics because we are really concerned about fundamental physics. And we know that our young generations and our region need more fundamental. They are were involved in applied and uh, several topics which they assume that they will produce more technological developments by this, but we always say basic science is really the basic and we should also take into account this basic science and we should also support it and uh, motivate it. And uh, this is what you are doing for us right now. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your kind words. And I want to thank uh, our host for the initiative. I think it's absolutely fantastic to bring people, to bring science to a broad audience. And I thank him also for inviting me. It's really been a pleasure to be here. I mean, it was, the, uh, it was uh, the idea, by the way, just uh, because um, it was the idea of uh, Friedi Cachasso. So I was uh, with discussion with Friedi Cachasso and the others. So, um, uh, and um, uh, for, for the first time I was hesitated really because I was thinking that you are very busy but uh, Freddy Cachasso, I mean, uh, at PI was encouraged me and uh, uh, I send you an email and uh, thank you so much, I mean, for accepting my invitation. Well, it's been a pleasure and I hope there would be more interaction.
Uh, yes, uh, next. I think uh, science is a good bridge between different people. And different okay, people. Professor, for next week, I mean, just for the audience before, uh, well, I mean, uh, we, we can give you the last word. So for the next, I mean, uh, as we have last time, uh, Cameron Vapa for the public lecture, we will have also um, Cameron Vapa for, uh, uh, I mean, a special talk uh, about swampland conjecture, which is a hot topic. After that, we'll have just uh, to let you know, Professor, after Cameroon Vafa, we will have Carlo Rovelli to discuss about his vision about time. After that, Martin Rees, and after that, Steven Weinberg. So those guys who accept, so I try to, I mean, uh, um, um, uh, I mean invite varieties of uh, uh, Greek names in different topics. I mean, for uh, making bridge between, uh, I mean, Arabic uh, communities and uh, publics and the Greek names in theoretical physics. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. So, um, uh, Ahmed, I mean, maybe you can, uh, I mean, uh, sure. say a few words sure. or, uh, yes. Okay. First of all, thank you, Professor Nathan, for your time, for this great it's been a pleasure. Thank you again. شكرا لجميع الحضور على حضورهم ومشاركتهم لنا جلسة اليوم شكرا لمن شاركنا بالأسئلة والمعلومات لغناء الجلسة شكرا مرة أخرى لحضوركم نلتقي بكم قريبا في لقاءات جديدة مع حمالقة جدل نذكر بموعدنا الأسبوع القادم إن شاء الله مع كاميرون ضافة محاضرة ستكون للمتخصصين طبعا مرحب بحضور الجميع ولكن الموضوع سيكون نوعا ما تخصصي إن شاء الله شكرا. دكتور أكرم هل تريد إضافة شيء؟ نعم yes. So uh, for last things, uh, so Professor, I give you the last words, I mean, to say, really thank you so much again for, uh, I mean, uh, um, I mean, uh, your acceptance. And also I will maybe forward your salutation, I mean, to, uh, I mean, uh, if you want uh, to your PI collaborators, Friede Cachasso, Davida Gaiotto, uh, uh, Rob Myers, or the others, if you want, so. But I am really, it was, I mean, great pleasure to have you and thank you so much. I mean, to help me supporting uh, theoretical physics or science in general in Arab community. And uh, we look forward maybe to, um, I mean, um, uh, other names or collaborations. So thank you so much. And you have um, your last words, Professor. Thank you. Well, I don't know what to say. I, I enjoyed it. I hope the audience enjoys it. I think this is really a worthwhile thing to do. I, for this reason, if you remember, I responded almost instantaneously to your email. I think this is something that should be done. And I encourage you to continue this. And as a Professor Shaban Khalid said, the corona will be over and then we should all meet in person. It will be much more fun and more effective. Hopefully, yes. As I said, you are welcome in Algeria, in Egypt, in Tunisia, Morocco, in everywhere in Arab countries, Professor. Thank you. So he now you can. Egypt before Kakram. He visited Egypt, I think, uh, uh, Alexandria Library at least the last time, if I remember ah, okay. correctly. Okay, Professor. So, Ahmed, uh, I mean, you can finish Arab right now. Thank you, Professor, again. Shukran li jamil hudur. Talkum ala khair. Ila liqa. Shukran. 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 Shuk